Well, good morning, you all. It's so good to see you on this Sunday morning. I think this is maybe the only time I would say we are the frozen chosen. <laughs> but, uh, I hope I never say that again. <laughs> Did Mike Black not say that? Somebody said it. Somebody said it? I figured that was an old joke that... Uh, well, we are in a great text of Scripture, so if we're cold, this should warm our hearts because um, this is a great portion of the book of Ephesians and one of the central themes or subjects that Paul speaks on, the mystery. I'm going to take a rather lengthy text because it all holds together. It's a uh, uh, a text that I think needs to be taught in, in this, ex, this extent. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation... There was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit, or we can translate that by the Spirit. To be sp specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the, men, of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places." This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Hamlet told his friend and schoolmate, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. That's a quote you've probably heard many times. Modern materialists don't like that quote. They dismiss that statement. It suggests something that they don't want to hear or don't believe, and that is that there's something beyond the material. But Paul would have liked it. He believed it. He taught on some of those things in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. He didn't believe in ghosts like Hamlet did, but he wrote of angels and tells of the manifold wisdom of God. But all of that comes under a larger subject, which is the mystery. Who doesn't like a mystery, a sleuth like Sherlock Holmes or Ecule Perrault. It's a hard name to pronounce. These men with this, these preternatural, these uncanny abilities to find clues and solve cases. But well, we all like that. But that's not the mystery Paul reveals in Ephesians chapter 3. He didn't figure it out. He, he could, it couldn't be discovered by logic and study. The mystery, Paul wrote, was a, a secret hidden in God, he said. So it could only be known by special revelation, and it had been revealed to him and the apostles. 
It came as a shock to many in the church. It, it took time for them to adjust to it. Paul has given some indication of it in the previous chapter. But in the third chapter, in, in verse 6, he states it plainly. Gentiles are fellow heirs with Jewish Christians. The two are spiritual equals. That's the subject which he introduced by reminding them in verse 1 that he was a prisoner. They knew that. He was in Rome. He was a prisoner of Caesar. But Paul called himself a prisoner of Christ, meaning a prisoner for Christ. Due to Christ, due to preaching Christ, preaching the gospel, but also he added that he was a prisoner for the sake of you Gentiles. It was because of the mystery and the privilege he was given of preaching it to the Gentiles across the empire that got him in trouble with the Jews and landed him in prison. Luke recounted it fully in Acts chapters 21 and 22. Paul had gone to Jerusalem with a gift from the Gentile churches of Macedonia and, and Corinth to help the poor Jewish saints. It was an expression of Gentile love for them and equality with them. While there, he went to the temple to worship when he was recognized by some Jews from Asia, probably from Ephesus. A mob seized him, would have killed him, when the Roman soldiers rescued him. Safely in their custody, he asked to be allowed to speak to the crowd. He recounted his history as a rabbi and a persecutor of the church and his conversion on the Damascus Road in a bright light. I fell to the ground, he said, and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene. The Jewish crowd listened to him very carefully. But when they heard him speak of the mission Christ gave him, go for I, I will send you far away to the Gentiles, everything changed. They tore their shirts, they threw dust in the air, they called for his death. It demonstrated that divide that the law caused, what Paul spoke of in chapter 2, the Jewish hostility toward Gentiles, the dogs. The joining of the two groups into one new man is what the mystery is all about. It was a complete mystery to the Jewish crowd in the temple, but even the hint of it was anathema to them. Paul was a blasphemer in their minds and worthy only of death. And so began Paul's years of imprisonment, first in Jerusalem, then in Caesarea, and finally in Rome, from where he wrote this letter to the Ephesians, one of the four prison epistles. So Paul reminded them as he introduced the subject of the mystery that he was there for the sake of you Gentiles. And they are without regrets. That was Paul, a, a selfless man who was willing to risk his life for the church, for the elect of God across the globe. His love for them, his love for the Lord, put him in harm's way to preach to the lost. And then he told them of his special ministry to them, what he calls the stewardship or ministry that God had given him. He called it a ministry of grace, which God gave to him for them. Paul was made a steward or manager of the gospel and its message to the Gentiles. In that role, he was given special revelation of the mystery. In verses 4 through 6, Paul explained to the Ephesians what he calls the mystery of Christ. He had explained a little about it 
in chapter 2, how Jews and Gentiles are united in Christ, who reconciled them to God in one body, making them all fellow citizens of God's household. But now in verse 6, he summarizes it. That Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now that is something the Jewish people had never imagined. Just the statement that Christ had sent Paul off to the Gentiles sent them into a rage. But this was even more radical, that uncircumcised Gentiles would be equal partners with the Jews in the blessings of salvation, and the blessings of the kingdom to come. They couldn't imagine it, because it had never before been revealed. Paul stated that in verse 5, that... In other generations, it had not been made known. It was a mystery sealed up and hidden in God. Now, Gentile salvation was known. It had been revealed. God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, that all the families of the earth would be blessed in him. Isaiah called the Messiah a light to the nations and prophesied that salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. There were Gentile God-fearers and proselytes, converts to Judaism. Rahab the Canaanite and Ruth the Moabitess were saved and became Israelites. But this was different. This was something new and, and unanticipated. Believing Gentiles were spiritual equals with believing Jews, co-heirs of the promises and the kingdom with the Jews. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is one of the great texts about that. Genesis 15 6, a great text on that. But it had different consequences in the Old Testament. Gentiles came under the law and they identified with Israel. In effect, they became Jews. No longer. Gentiles are now saved independently of Israel. The law has been annulled, that is, it's been made inoperative, not destroyed. It is still Scripture. It is helpful. It is as much Scripture as the books of the New Testament. And we study it equally but it, it's not the rule of life as it was with Israel. Now, apart from the law and by faith alone, Gentiles and Jews alike have salvation and are made into one new man, fellow members in the church. We're both equals in the church. Jews and Gentiles are no longer rivals, no longer enemies, but friends, brothers and sisters in the same family, the, the one family of God with the same hope and same destiny. So the mystery is equality, the equality of the Jew and the Gentile in Christ, joined together in a spiritual relationship with Christ, a a close living relationship with the Savior equally. And Paul was stating that that this this ministry of the mystery was given to him. Verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Everything is a gift. It is all according to grace. Paul knew he had not earned this privilege. In fact, he he could only accomplish it, he could only do it by God's sovereign grace, or as he said, according to the working of his power. Paul did amazing things in his ministry of the mystery, in in carrying the gospel to the Gentiles and teaching them all the, the blessings they had in Christ. He crossed continents, 
survived storms at sea and endured beatings, imprisonments, hunger, thirst, and exposure to the elements. No apostle worked harder or sacrificed more than Paul. But he did it all gladly, impelled by the grace of God, by his love for the Lord, his love for the Gentiles, and by the power of God working in him. As he wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, by way of application, that is true of every one of us. We live each day, every moment of every day, according to the, the working of His power. So that we can do what is pleasing to Him in spite of ourselves. And do it only because of Him. We're not left to ourselves. Uh, we can accomplish much as a gift of God's grace. And Paul knew that better than anyone. He understood the grace of God better than anyone. By grace alone was Paul's watchword. The only thing that could explain the, the great privilege given to him to be the minister of the mystery was the grace of God. A blessing which really was, was a mystery to him. I think he was mystified by the fact that he, of all people, was chosen. He kind of expresses that here. To me, he said in verse 8, that is, to me of all people, the very least of the saints, this privilege of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles was given. What, what a surprise. Who would have thought? And his opinion of himself didn't, didn't elevate with time. Later, he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, that he was the chief of sinners. Paul had an, a, an especially notorious history. He, as you know this, he would, had been a persecutor of the church. The blood of the saints was on his hands, so he called himself the very least of all of them. But was Paul the hardest working apostle, the greatest friend of the Gentiles and the Jews, being too hard on himself? Was this just unhealthy self-loathing? Critics today would probably dismiss it as that, give some psychological explanation for Paul's feelings about himself, a disparaging description. But no one was more well-grounded and mentally healthy than the Apostle Paul. What he expressed here is what every believer in Christ will, will sense about himself or herself as we mature in the faith. We, we don't become more and more approving of ourselves and amazed at how wonderful we are. We realize how we're saved by the grace of God. Man's problem... Our problem, even as Christians, was stated by Anselm in the 11th century when he told his debate partner, you have not yet considered the great greatness of the weight of sin. You've heard me say that a number of times. It's a good one to learn and memorize. Paul had considered that. Paul understood that. And the more we understand God's grace, the more we will know ourselves and the more we will wonder why did God choose me? Why did Christ come into this world specifically to save me? The result of that self-reflection and understanding is not discouragement. It's not depression, but joy. Joy and a, and a desire to serve the Lord because it is, understa it is understanding the unconditional love of God. It's out of God's love that we have spiritual life and faith and forgiveness and have the hope of a glorious future and have meaning and purpose now in the present. The Lord has given us a mission. That's what Paul marveled over, that he, it was given to him to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. 
Every believer in Christ is in Him. That is, joined to Him in a, a living relationship, like a, like a branch in a vine, as Jesus illustrated it in John 15. And in Christ, we are, are joined to what is in Him, and that is unfathomable riches. We have access to that. This word unfathomable in Greek literally means not to be tracked out, which seems to suggest tracks or footsteps that cannot be followed. There, there are too many of them. So the idea uh, is of uh, something that's inexhaustible. The point is, there is there's just no end to the riches that are found in Christ. They, they go in every direction. Past, present, future blessings. Blessings from the judge of all the earth. From wiping the slate clean of our crimes, misdemeanors and guilt, justifying us to making us heirs of His glorious eternal kingdom and giving us a secure present. You can't be any more secure in any, any way than you are right now in Christ. Whatever the weather is, whatever the circumstances are, we're absolutely, absolutely secure in Him. That's our present. And we have a glorious future that we look forward to. We are governed at every moment, by God's gracious hidden hand, to work all things to His glory and all things to our good. So as William Cooper wrote in his hymn, Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. The blessings are constant and inexhaustible. And Paul, of all people, Saul of Tarsus, had the privilege of telling Gentile believers that they were the full recipients of those blessings with the Jewish believers. They are equals in the eyes of God. He has no favorites. He loves all equally and infinitely. And as we follow those tracks, follow the Lord's direction, we will only increase in wisdom and blessing. The challenge is to believe that and, and not believe the alternative or the many alternatives that are offered. We, we see that challenge early in the, the book of Proverbs. The Proverbs were written to guide the young and the naive in the safe paths of wisdom. There are always those who are seeking to redirect. There are always those who are seeking to hijack the naive into following different paths, different ways. In chapter 1 of the Proverbs, Solomon warns his son of that. He said, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. Throw in your lot with us. In other words, they proposed adventure and easy riches. It's attractive. It has an appeal. But it's foolish. It's the way of self-destruction. Solomon said they ambush their own lives. What Paul offered the Gentiles was the wisdom of Solomon and more, the manifold wisdom of God. In Colossians 2, he said, In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Gentiles who, in spite of their many philosophers and philosophies, walked in darkness and lived foolish and hopeless lives, were now included in all the blessings of wisdom and knowledge. They go out in every direction of life to give Peace and real prosperity. When I say prosperity, I mean moral, spiritual, intellectual prosperity. It restores the soul and, and stores up riches for all eternity. That's the good life. The truly good life. And that's what Paul 
revealed and taught. Through faith alone, in Christ alone, we, Gentile and Jew, male and female, black, white, Asian, however you want to divide the, the human race, every believer has the unfathomable riches of Christ. You have that in Christ. But Paul's ministry was not only to reveal these, these glorious truths to the Gentiles across the globe, but also to the angels in heaven. That's what he states in verses 9 and 10. To bring light, to bring to light the mystery, so the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Now that is a surprising fact. God has given the church, each local church, the responsibility of instructing the angels of God, instructing them with wisdom, especially as it is revealed in the mystery of the church. That's quite a responsibility if you think about it. That's what he says. And there is much to reveal. Here, God's wisdom is described as manifold. And that has the idea of multicolored. It gives the picture of a, a, a richly woven tapestry or a, a field of flowers. And I witnessed that a few years ago in Israel. I think I've mentioned this to you before, but it, it applies again here. It was early spring when the the wildflowers bloom, and they bloom all over. I mean, the, it, the, the landscape is filled with them. And we happened to be driving in a field not far from the Valley of Elah where David slew Goliath. And the field was full of these wildflowers. And so we stopped to just look at them. And, and they were of every color imaginable and some colors that I've never seen before. I couldn't tell you what the color was. Couldn't name it. It was a magnificent sight. And, and that's the picture that Paul gives here of God's wisdom. Multicolored, multidimensional, many-sided, unexpected. And the church has the responsibility of bringing to light this wisdom, not only to ourselves, but to the angelic host, especially in regard to the mystery, the equality in the church of Jews and Gentiles together in harmony. One of uh, my professors at, uh, at seminary, Dr. Harold Honer, wrote in his commentary on Ephesians, Equality between Jews and Gentiles was beyond the comprehension of any human being and any angelic being. In chapter 2, we saw the, the historical division between the two groups, which is one of the basic divisions of mankind, Jew and Gentile. It was, like, uh, it was like this division was like a stone wall that separated the two with death threats on it. And yet, God brought the Gentiles who were far off, He brought them near and joined them with the Jews in one body, the church, which Paul called one new man, unified and equal. We, we all believe in the gospel in Christ the Savior, and having believed in Him, we are joined in Him and put in the, the promise given to Abraham. All of us are put in that promise given to Him. What Paul calls in Romans 11, verse 17, the rich root of the olive tree. We've been placed in that, that promise and promises given to him, given to Abraham and the patriarchs. We all now share the same life in the Holy Spirit, the same hope of the resurrection, the same hope of the future kingdom and of the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. We all have equal access to God in prayer. 
That is the unexpected, multicolored wisdom of God in the sovereign grace of God. And we're to proclaim it to all. And in so doing, in, in, in proclaiming it at this moment, we're, we're instructing the angels. Not only do we teach it, though, we live it. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy. If God would give us eyes to see, as he did to Elisha's servant in Dothan, we might see the, the, the sky above, full of the angelic hosts, horses and chariots of fire all around. They're here. If I read Paul correctly, they're here. Maybe a few of us here this morning, but this is a big congregation, bigger than we know. And we don't need to feel like we need to greet them. But I think what we should do is certainly greet one another. That is, we should, we should show, exhibit the unity the, that we have for one another, the love that we have for one another, model the wisdom of God. They are watching and they are learning and what they, they should see should match what they hear. And they should see this unity of the body and this love of the saints for one another, those who are placed in the family of God. And I would say this as well. You have their attention, not just in this place, but wherever we are. Whatever the situation may be, when we go through trials, um, what they see in you is what Paul spoke of in verse 7. And, and we'll refer to in verse 20, the power that works within us. They see God's grace. They see His enabling grace in us. We have a, a wider audience in life than we might realize. So if, if no one else notices your situation in life, your predicament in life, the trial that you may be going to, going through, the, the, the personal challenges of life, well, they do. They see it. They see how you respond to it. They see God's work of grace in your life. When you respond well, they're instructed as they see the grace of God played out in our lives in various circumstances. We're never alone. So we need to live a life that's consistent with what he's saying here. It instructs the angels. The church is a, a work of his grace, his masterpiece of grace. The church is not an afterthought. It's not plan B that God had when Israel rejected plan A and rejected their Messiah. It was all carefully planned out from all eternity. No mistakes. It's all according to God's plan. According, and according to verse 11, this is where the multi-purpose, manifold wisdom of God is seen in His eternal plan or eternal purpose in creating the church. And the, the greater wisdom, the great wisdom of His plan is revealed in how it was carried out when Paul said, which Paul said he did in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he did that on the cross when his son redeemed a people for himself. What, what an amazing thing. God planned salvation from all eternity. His plan involved choosing, electing a people for himself, not, not a chosen few, a vast multitude of souls, fallen people, guilty people, and he gave them to his son to save. And he did that. Not with a strong arm by, by coming as a conquering king, but in the weakness of a man, the weakness of a servant who allowed himself to be arrested, beaten, and slain on a cross. It appeared to be a tragic defeat, but was actually a joyous victory. 
when the godly one died for the ungodly, suffered their penalty in their place, and so secured life for them by his death. He achieved it. That's the wisdom of God in the plan no man or angel could have imagined. But in that way alone, God could be what Paul called him in Romans 3 verse 26, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's grace. We have forgiveness. We have eternal life. Hope now and glory for eternity. Not through any work of our own, but the work of Christ alone, which we receive, not achieve, we receive through faith alone. That's the wisdom of God that, that Paul was given to preach to the Jews and the Gentiles and to bring to light to the angels. And we are to carry on that great work, work that's gone on for 2,000 years. Now we're part of it. In what we say and what we do. And we can do it with confidence. That's the assurance Paul gave in verse 12 because we are in Christ, the one who carried out the plan successfully. He will give us success as a result. And he does that by giving us access. In Christ, Paul said, <clears throat> we have boldness and confident access through, through faith in him. For all those that Christ has saved, he gives access to the Father. The judge of all the earth is now our Father who accepts us. We shouldn't doubt that. Again, he doesn't accept us based on what we've done, because if that were the case, then we'd all have reason to doubt that he's our father at any given time. But that's not the basis of his acceptance of us. It's not what we've done. If that were, uh, that, that were our ground of acceptance, we'd have no acceptance. We can never be confident because we fail continually. The Father accepts us based on what Christ has done, which is complete and perfect, and Jesus said it succinctly and, and, and explicitly when he declared from the cross, it is finished. We can add nothing to that. And to add something to that, Paul told the Galatians, is a different gospel and no gospel at all, and is a blasphemy. Now, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that is the basis of our boldness in coming to Him. Not ourselves, not what we've done, but altogether what He has done. And so with such access, which is constant... We can ask the Father for help, and He will give it according to His perfect wisdom. And, and, and as Paul will later say in this chapter, more than we ask or think beyond that. He gives it according to His perfect wisdom, gives us power for faithfulness and success in our mission. That's where the success comes from. This is why it's so important for us to understand who we are and, and what we are by God's grace and grace alone and be men and women of prayer. Must be people of, of, the, of study and we must be people of prayer. Kind of look to Him continually. And so with such access, which is constant as I said, we, uh, we ask the Father for help and He will give it. He will give it according to His wisdom and power. Now, on, the basis, on that basis, Paul exhorts the Ephesians and us in verse 13 with strong encouragement. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Paul concluded where he began with his imprisonment and tribulations. 
He was a prisoner of the, the mighty empire that could crush the little apostle and leave those Ephesians without his guidance. That may have discouraged them. They may have frightened them. But Paul wanted them to be encouraged, not discouraged. He wanted, he was not, he was not the prisoner of Nero, but as he said in verse 1, he was the prisoner of Christ. A prisoner for his service, but also Christ's possession. And so absolutely secure. Just as we all are, absolutely secure in Christ. God works everything according to His eternal purpose. Even Paul's imprisonment was part of God's plan for himself and for those Ephesians. And he had tribulations, that those that he had, he said the, the tribulations that he had were even for their glory. Now he didn't say how they were for, his tribulations were for the glory of the Ephesians. Maybe... His example of perseverance would strengthen them so that, that when they suffered for their faith, they would, they would suffer well, resulting in eternal glory. What Paul shows here is that tribulations are not meaningless. They are an opportunity to represent Christ to men and angels. And there is glory, eternal glory, in that. What a privilege to be part of the church and the mystery that God had planned from all eternity to be chosen of God, redeemed by Christ, forgiven and bound for glory. The angels marvel over all that God has done with fallen humanity, made it into a new humanity, into one new man, in which former enemies are now friends, at peace with each other, at peace with God. If you're not part of that, but want to be, then come to Christ. Trust in Him and His sacrifice for sinners. Receive the Savior as your Lord and God and be saved. He will receive you. And may God help you to do that and help all of us who have done that to rejoice in the great privilege that He's given us and the great position we have in Christ. Now let's, let's stand and sing number, hymn number 27 in the songs of praise before the throne of God above, and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 27. Father, we thank you for your Son, who is our Savior and our God, the eternal second person of the Trinity, who took to himself a body and a human nature in order to sacrifice himself in our place that we might have life. And now we're hidden in him. And when you see us, you see us through Him as righteous and acceptable. We can claim nothing for ourselves. It is all Your grace, and we give You praise for that and thank You for it. Help us to understand it more and to live lives that would be consistent with that. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace. In Christ's name, amen.